Moran, Director for the National Reentry Resource Center, which is managed by the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Serving as a moderator for today's webinar, and we'll be facilitating a question and answer session at the end of our presentation. After presentations by our speakers today, there will be ta a time for you to ask your questions. To ask a question, please type the question into the Q&A panel at the bottom right-hand portion of your screen. We'll be to answer your questions, but with the 1,000 attendees, it's unlikely we'll, we'll be able to get to all your questions. Check out the chat box in the center right-hand portion of your screen to find out how to access the webinar and PowerPoint after the presentation. If you have technical or audio problems during this webinar, please call WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-239. Please understand there are some technical issues you may not be able to resolve during the presentation. For this event, we are recording this event and we will post it on our website at www.nationalreentryresourcecenter.org. We are posted online later this week, and once it's been posted, we will email you a link to the recording. We to have a distinguished panel of speakers that are taking part in this webinar. I would like to welcome Director A.T. Wall from the Rhode Island Department of Corrections, as well as Moon Lowe and Matthew DeMichelle from the American Probation and Parole Association. I'd now like to turn the webinar over to our presenters. Thank you, Ann. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll get into the actual training. I'd like to talk a little bit about the two organizations that are hosting this webinar session today. Reentry Resource Center, established by the Second Chance Act, and administered by the Bureau of Justice Assistance, U.S. Department of Justice, for education, training, and technical assistance to states, tribes, territories, local governments, providers, nonprofit organizations, and corrections institutions working on prisoner reentry. It is a product of the Council of State Governments Justice Center, with project partners including the Urban Institute, Association of State Correctional Administrators, and, and the American Probation and Parole Association. It's also got about an advisory board, which helps coordinate support and services for Second Chance Act grantees and entry field. Its open mission is to advance the reentry field through knowledge transfer and dissemination and to promote evidence-based best practices. The Emission and Parole Association, also known as APA, is an international association composed of members from the United States, Canada, and other countries actively involved with probation, parole, and community-based corrections in the adult and juvenile sectors. All the government, including local, state, provincial, legislative, executive, judicial, and federal agencies, are found among its constituents. Over the has grown to become the voice for thousands of probation and parole practitioners, including line staff, supervisors, and administrators, editors, volunteers, and concerned citizens with an interest in criminal and juvenile justice are also among APA's members. By trying to effectively provide services to its constituents, APA presents a strong unified, unified voice for the field of community corrections. The goal of this training is to educate you, the participants, on effective case planning strategies for individuals during the pre and pre release stages of reentry. Which the speakers will go into more detail with an underlying focus on evidence based practices, or EBP. Please keep in mind when discussing these stages of effective case planning strategies that they are not fixed. What we mean by that is that an issue is in one area may interrelate with another area. As you read, the training has four overall learning objectives. The first is to differentiate between case planning and case management practices during entry. Sometimes these concepts may be used interchangeably, but it's important to understand the characteristics that make them distinct from one another. The second objective is to define the purpose of the case plan, that is, why is it important and why is it such a key element in determining the success of, the, of an individual during the reentry process? The objectives will focus on the key elements of an effective case plan during both the pre and post release stages of reentry. So let's begin with differentiating between developing a case plan, case management practice. I will ask uh, uh, Dr. Wall and uh, Dr. Demo to elaborate 
elaborate on the very simple definitions that are shown for case planning and case management. Carl, let's begin with you. What do you see as the key differences between these two concepts? Case plan should not be confused with case management. Let's talk about the features of each. A plan refers, as is noted on the screen, to a written structured tool. It does the offender and the case manager, be it uh, a killer uh, behind walls, a discharge plan, or, or a probation parole agent uh, post-release, directs uh, both the offender and the supervising authority toward targeted activities and outcomes. It has some components. Uh, it's accepted that uh, a case plan will include the following. Uh, talk more about them later in the conference. A needs assessment tool, motivational interviewing, that is to say interviewing designed to draw the offender out and open up the dialogue, uh, build the offender's strengths and assets, focusing on the reduction of risk and the reduction of the criminogenic factors that lead to risk, uh, ability uh, for behavior, really the keys and they increase the likelihood that a structured approach is in place that it will meet the expectations and achieve the essential goals. That would be the case plan. Uh, management, on the other hand, is about a process. A process why, by which counselors, officers uh, ensure that the supervision conditions are being met or that the goals of the case plan uh, are being achieved. And so this management is living. The plan is a living document, and case management is a living process. It goes through the institutional phase, transition, supervision. It may be modified on the events. Uh, Proposition, fit, comply with conditions, and so forth. Good deal. Thank you, Director Wall. Uh, Dr. DeMichelle, is there anything you'd like to add to uh, what Director Wall Provided. No, I'd just uh, like to reiterate um, what uh, Director Wall stated and that a, a case plan is, uh, the way I think about it, is it's a, a blueprint for behavioral expectations as it sets rules and expectations for offenders and also will serve to uh, shape the offender and officer interactions throughout the uh, supervision process. And then um, three with Director Wall still is uh, to suggest that the case management is this uh, living process. I like the way that uh, AT put that, that case management is a living process that evolves throughout the interaction between the offender and the officer. Okay, both. So uh, now that we have a clear understanding of, of some of the key differences between case planning and case management, you might want to ask yourself, what's the point? Uh, what's the purpose of developing a case plan for an individual upon his or her, her re into the community? Uh, Dr. Michelle, uh, could you kind of follow up on that in your opinion? Well, why do individuals need case plans during the reentry stages? Very good question, Nathan. Thank you. And I've um, I've identified four essential kind of uh, purposes or reasons why a case plans should be uh, used for effective uh, reentry supervision, and these are found or uh, um, borrowing from from uh, an article by McCary and Gary Hensman some time ago. Uh, first, I would say that a case plan is used to target specific ways to achieve measurable effectiveness offender outcomes. Two, I would say that a case plan um, increases offenders' ownership, acceptance, and effort towards working to achieve these goals in a timely manner. Third, case plans increase the focus on a risk needs reduction strategy in community supervision. And fourth, case, case plans provide a uh, structured method to increase completion of core agency objectives. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Wall, is there anything you'd like to add to uh, Dr. D. Michelle's response? I think that uh, Matt gave us a great, great summary, and mm -hmm. I would say that the big so what, of course, is uh, to help achieve our overall objective. And it's important to keep in mind that ultimately what we're trying to do through this process is reduce recidivism and create safer communities and also to help ex-offenders become more successful, productive, contributing uh, citizens and law-abiding. Okay. So our uh, speakers have defined 
case planning, and its purpose during reentry. We'll now ask them to discuss some of the key elements for effective case planning during reentry. Director Wall is going to first move us into the topic of pre-release preparation as an essential element of successfully returning individuals to the community. However, what do we mean by pre-release preparation? And how does one administer pre-release preparation? The important question is to improve the success of released individuals from prison into the community. First, discuss one of the most essential elements of pre-release preparation, that is, when to begin. I'll take that, Nathan. Of course, the goal would be pre-release preparation begins at institutional uh, the individuals would enter jail or prison and be assessed for their risk to reoffend and what are called criminogenic needs, those characteristics and factors that uh, lead to uh, offense. Uh, then would be types and levels of programming and security uh, matched to their specific characteristics. Sometimes, of course, uh, it will happen later than it intake. Uh, after classification, closer to release, uh, that may be a resource issue. However, it does need to be done at some point before the offender uh, walks out the door. pre release planning is essential to improve those release outcomes, and the institutional phase is an opportunity to the time that someone is incarcerated and begin building for that ultimate result of, of reduced recidivism, law-abiding behavior. In course, is the classic way in which we encourage uh, classify individuals, depending what their custody and security level sh should be, and all what kinds of what the risk to reoffend upon police is going to be. Those factors are that are likely to lead to reoffense, and again, more about that later. And then match the individuals with the right programming, programming that is aligned with those risks and those needs this to develop an expectation of rewards and sections, carrots and sticks associated with uh, compliance with the case plan and institutional behavior. Yes, sir. All right. You can continue, Director Wall. I would be happy to uh, to do that, uh, and I think it makes sense because I'm um, using terms risk, need, and I think we need to talk more about uh, those principles mean if we're going to be effective in case planning. Uh, uh, basically, this applying the risk to reoffend and the fears that contribute to criminal behavior, identifying them before individuals return to their home communities. That assessment, uh, and as I said, there is risk assessment and needs assessment. Uh, risk assessment is probably associated with criminal behavior and, uh, and needs for treatment. Act fact is needs assessment become standard best practice in our field over the last 20 years. I can recall an era when we didn't speak in terms or think that way. Uh, NEX is very much at the core of what we do. So, RIP, we are trying to determine how likely the individual is to re-offend upon release. And using uh, trust and and measurable instruments to do so. Uh, the rule of is to provide more intensive services to the high-risk individuals. That speaks to needs assessment. Uh, Lower-risk individuals may require only minimal level of services. The principle is to figure out what the dynamic needs are. Let me give examples of uh, what I mean by needs. And, uh, and interventions. These are programs designed to address the issues that contribute to criminal behavior. 
uh, thus in research have shown that these are some of the core pieces. Uh, anti-social thinking and attitudes. Uh, Companions. What people do you hang with? Uh, and what kind of uh, attitudes do they have? Quality. Uh, are you uh, at odds with the accepted way of doing things in the world? Family marital dysfunction. Other needs abuse, which is of course traditionally considered antisocial, and you spend your free time. Also, a key component, as you can see, they're not necessarily what's called static. They're changing factors such as criminal history, uh, sentence length, and so forth. They are part of the assessment process, but a lot of it is what's called dynamic, things that can change depending on circumstances and over time. So what I mean when I'm talking about uh, risk and need principles. And like Nathan, I can proceed to talk more about uh, the assessment process itself. Yeah, do so, Director Wall. Uh, this is really at the core of pre-release preparation. How are we to decide what the appropriate level of supervision should be upon release? And what characteristics are, routine, are related to success or failure on immunity supervision? That's where we have risk and needs assessment instruments. Provide staff with that kind of information. I've spoken about what some of the factors are in risk assessment. Uh, they are predictable predictive instruments to categorize offenders according to the likelihood of recidivism generally lead to three risk categories, low, medium, and high. And they are the basis of research in the record and also face-to-face -face interviews with offenders in custody and perhaps later on supervision. The assessment is not only to determine what will happen when someone is released, but it also determines the effectiveness of the treatment that takes place in prison. Um, there is a whole treatment continuum, but in institutions, there is an opportunity to board the offender and begin the treatment phase. One of the advantages of incarceration is that uh, the around stops. Whatever going on in the community, uh, there's a point of action when you are behind bars. A second advantage is that uh, incarceration and all the deprivations that go with it tend to get people's attention. There are opportunities inside. Uh, and if we use risk assessment instruments correctly, then we're able to figure out what kind of services they should be plotted into as part of its management to address specific needs. If somebody's problem is that they can't control their anger, then be that that's more important than putting them in, that anger management's more important than putting them in, say, an occasional. And that would be an example. Uh, interestingly, if people are determined to be low risk and have low needs, that is to say their lives are, notwithstanding incarceration, pretty well pulled together, uh, harshly be done by putting those folks in programs. They become exposed to attitudes and thinking that might not be healthy for, for them. And let's face it, agency resources are limited. We don't want to use them incorrectly. Assess helps us target those limited resources to the people who need them most. It's all true that it's not something that we in corrections can do alone. We need to collaborate with service providers who have expertise in these areas to ensure that we are giving them the best programs that we can offer. It leads me into institutional programming. 
we talked about how the fact that prisons and jails are encouraged to offer programs that are based on the needs identified in the assessment. I add another piece to the mix. They must be what we call evidence-based. That is, proven by the research to effective in addressing those criminogenic characteristics and thereby lowering the risk to read. In other words, an evidence-based program means that the, there is proof that we are doing in that program is leading to the outcomes we want, low recidivism. And it appears that dealing with our population research and literature show is ever else is true about a program. It must address what is no cognitive behavioral thinking. That is to say, patterns of thought and behavior associated with an antisocial mindset. Uh, for example, uh, a lapathy with the victim, an attitude, sort of they got what they deserved, or I'm the victim, because I'm behind bars. Those are the examples of, of an antisocial mindset. We also know the fact is there are going to be fewer program slots available than there are inmates waiting to take them. All more important to prioritize enrollment. And here are some thoughts about how to do, do that. The offense risk uh, is certainly an important criterion. Refer from the parole board. If the parole board is telling us this is what we want to see before we'll consider release, that should be prioritized. Proceed to the date of release. The kinds of criteria is to manage the scarce resources. Also, as we've said before, the carrot and stick approach. And here I will focus on the, the carrot pieces because we all understand the sticks, loss of earned time, uh, disciplinary infractions leading to disciplinary confinement and so forth. Some of the carrots, of course, are uh, incentives, uh, let inmates, families, and loved ones know that they're working hard and making progress. Better assignments, possibly from sentence where that's permitted by the law. Uh, and also motivational interviewing, again, a way to engage the offender in thinking about his and her own life make them a contributing partner to the plan. Those thoughts about uh, what should take place in the institutional phase, uh, Nathan, and, and this all precedes discharge planning. Hey, Drew Wall, could you talk a little bit about uh, the discharge planning uh, aspect of uh, reentry? Sure, because let's face it, uh, the, what's happening in the institutions is all building toward a particular point. The plan would be that six to nine months prior to release, and that may be more likely in prison settings than in jail settings, and my department, by the way, is responsible not only for running the prisons, but also for the state's, uh, for the jail operations across the state and probation and parole, so we do see it in every dimension. So ideally, six to nine months prior to release, an inter should meet with a discharge planner. That is somebody who is dedicated to saying, sort of, your life in prison is coming to an end, you're going to be moving back to the community, let's begin to talk about how that is going to be managed uh, well. So the discharge planner then develops what, in essence, is a discharge plan. We talked about case planning as, as a living process, and the institutional plan will inform the discharge plan. The is going to look different, however, because it's talking about the point of release. Some people refer to these plans as transitional accountability plans, and they're taps. I like that phrase because the accountability piece Puts, uh, puts a lot of the uh, responsibility directly on the offender. In order to ensure that from continuity during a difficult period when incarceration gives way to life afterwards, uh, in, uh, you know, 
flexible, the district planning staff ought to represent community-based agencies, which ought to have re rep relationships with representatives of those organizations so that they're handoff to people whose responsibilities don't end at the door of the prison or the jail. And as we know that we're talking about a range of players in the human services, uh, housing, abuse and mental health treatment centers, the agencies responsible for employment, training, and placement, add to whatever federal benefits an offender might be due. The affected inmate really needs to be a participant rather than passive about this pre-release planning. So it's accurately reflective of the challenges the offender faces and the offender has a stake in it. It's not just something being done to him or her. If possible, include the family members in some way, the others who will be closely interacting with the loved one post-release so that they feel part of the process and can be a first line of uh, support and supervision. They can be valuable allies when they're offered the ability to be involved. And not neglect connections to law enforcement. Uh, in experience, law enforcement are a, a, an important component because they're realistic, they know offenders and their families, they're operating on the streets, and giving them information about who is coming out and what we know can be very helpful to maintaining public safety. Some other fundamentals that not everybody considers are state identification, driver's licenses lapsed, uh, certificates uh, be lost, pay financial obligations, fines and child support have to be considered, and uh, dynamics of family reunification. I can, I was firsthand, things are up close and personal in Rhode Island, so as director I have an opportunity to interact with offenders either by the walls or on the streets all the time. And I remember talking to one, and uh, he was, uh, I was encouraged, he was a very bright guy. I was encouraging him to pursue his education once he got out and to uh, take advantage of opportunities to, uh, to increase his earning power to think about the future, and stopped me and said, Director, I agree with everything you said. You know that on the day I walk out the door, I will have $22,000 in and fines I have to pay. It's an important reality check for us. We can't neglect some of those real basic things. Another one that uh, had been a handful behind the walls, uh, in trouble, I ended up spending a lot of time in administrative and disciplinary confinement I encountered on the street one evening, and I expected him to be gloating, saying that uh, uh, now that I'm on probation, parole, you don't have the same hold over me that you used to have. It was a different conversation than what I expected. Uh, his words were, Director, I want you to know that it's hard out here. I'm finding it very hard. Examples make the case for me of the importance of discharge planning and the importance of focusing on what it is that the offender really needs. Give that point called transition. Yeah, Director Wall, uh, can you? Kind of take us through this kind of this last stage of uh, pre-release planning and transition, uh, uh, and how it as a, a valuable point in, in the in the entry process. Uh, sure, um, transition is when the rubber meets the road. All that we've been talking about before is leading up to that uh, that moment and those days and weeks uh, when somebody leaves the highly structured environment of the field setting and moves into a world that is full of choices, challenges, and temptations. Uh, we know it's an especially precarious time for offenders returning to the community. Uh, both they and their loved ones experience great anxiety about that point. They make unrealistic expectations of one another. 
and we know that the returning offender who may have had plenty of issues before incarceration faces some serious advantages. Um, the, uh, the community uh, to he or she is returning may not be well prepared to integrate them, really dealing with its own problems, uh, lack connections to the traditional institutions, and of course, a criminal record. Uh, the re has shown that the first days weeks and months are critical to success or failure. And I would highly recommend that the responsible for post-release supervision have access to that discharge plan. The probation officer should work with that planner, making sure that it includes anything needed for compliance, conditions of supervision. And feasible, if the officer can meet with the offender he or she is still in custody or immediately when they get out to assess the relationship and review expectations, it's helpful. Fought on transition. We know that the best laid discharge plans uh, may founder on the rocks of reality. Uh, they require alteration. They may require adjustment. For example, housing arrangements can fall apart rapidly. Somebody who were staying at their sister's may find that they're couch surfing after a couple of weeks, and ultimately that they're homeless. The dis planner, the community-based providers, the supervising authority really need to be in close communication, especially during those first weeks, to minimize the impact of unforeseen events. That's what I have to say about transition. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Director Wall, and, and tell, talking to us about some of the key elements <clears throat> of pre-release uh, preparation. So now I'm moving to the discussion on post-release supervision. Uh, when it was all reintegrated back into the community, our next concern is with uh, the type of supervision that uh, that it entails. What elements of effective post-release supervision? Uh, Pre-planning is an essential part of successful post-release supervision. Once individuals are released in community from prison or jail, there are certain practices that are known to be related to reduce recidivism and improve intermediary goals. So, Shell, will you talk with us about some of those key elements? Thank you very much, Nathan, for introducing this section. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about in this webinar are going to essentially be what we have recognized as five elements to effective case planning for post-release supervision. Vision. And so the first one, uh, the first element we're going to talk about, as you can see here, is uh, what we have labeled involving the right partners. It's essentially creating these partnerships uh, between justice and non-justice system partners to provide an assortment of services. As we know that probation and parole can't, you know, be all things to all, all people in the community, but we can create effective partnerships to uh, provide a wide assortment of services to individuals returning to the community. And so uh, when I think of these multi-partner strategies for reintegrating individuals into the community, I think of an uh, initiative that was put in place by the California Department of Corrections some years ago uh, known as the Preventing Parolee Crime Program. <clears throat> and the uh, actual purpose of the Preventing Parolee Crime Program was to attempt to disrupt the sickle nature of parole revocations. And what they had seen in California was essentially a churning process of individuals coming to prison on parole and then turning them back into into prison. And these driving not only revocation numbers, but also driving the growth in California prisons uh, for quite some time. And so the, uh, the California Department of Corrections with the Preventing Parolee Crime Program, they sought to establish a broad network of services um, that encompassed uh, substance abuse treatment, literacy training, Training, imminent readiness training, and job placement uh, assistance as well. This is um, uh, recognizing the importance of establishing partners to bridge what the California legislature and other researchers have found to be uh, four essential skill areas or life domains to reduce recidivism. These are things that, uh, as you can see on this slide, and things that each of you in your uh, daily practice are realize that offenders are facing uh, when it comes to reentering society. And the first uh, is a main issue of employment, of finding an, uh, offenders employment and helping individuals not only find employment but then stay employed. Uh, secondly is meeting substance abuse recovery. Third is um, education. And fourth is providing uh, suitable realistic housing for individuals returning. 
did this uh, preventing parolee crime program function? Um, <clears throat> well, essentially what they did was that they reached out to the community to identify uh, non-justice system uh, agencies, uh, that they could partner with. So, for instance, the employment services were provided by two community-based employment organizations. The substance abuse education and recovery services were offered by two treatment networks. Then the literary and transitional housing uh, services were also provided uh, by different community par partners. Uh, we, we all know that uh, each of these service providers has different goals and missions. And while we talk about working in partnerships and collaborations, we know that those can always be difficult and uh, um, train and that uh, uh, battles over turf or min creep begin to be an issue. But I believe the point that we're trying to make here with effective case planning at post-release supervision is that case managers or probation and parole officers can act as this bridge or intermediary between these uh, transitional services and also uh, monitoring accountability and and supervision to achieve uh, what we all want, the overall mission, which is uh, preventing recidivism, uh, reducing revocations, and, and definitely reducing any new crimes that uh, parolees or probationers may commit. Thanks to our second point, which I believe is uh, something that uh, uh, Director Paul uh, mentioned quite a bit in his presentation on pre-release planning, and this is the idea of connecting with pre-release planners. So you know, just because it's post-release supervision doesn't mean that we should you know, forget all the work that went on in prison uh, and all the work that the uh, pre-release planners did. So beyond just developing a network of service providers in the community, post-release supervision needs um, to establish an ongoing dialogue with these pre-release planners. And so uh, related to this, an emerging principle of effective post-release supervision uh, is the notion of providing a continuity of care. And so use this phrase, continuity of care, what we're talking about is we're talking about integrating the things that go on in prison, the in-prison programming rather, with post-release treatment and supervision services so that there can be some continuity between uh, the type of programming that offenders received in prison and with that, that they're going to receive uh, um, once they've been released and they're on post-release supervision. And so, um, to date, the bulk of research emphasizing the need for the continuity of care, it does come from the substance abuse treatment field in which they're finding that in-prison treatment uh, um, needs to be complemented with similar, similar post-release treatment uh, um, services, and that you see an improvement in offender uh, um, outcomes when this is done. And so uh, researchers, probably namely, I would say Faye Taxman and, and some of her colleagues and others, they point to the importance of delivering this uninterrupted continuum of, of care bridges in prison treatment with post-release treatments. And researchers go further to identify that policy and decision makers will implement practices to ensure the process of transitioning individuals from prison to community-based treatment includes a systematic and validated assessment of post-prison treatment needs, which in turn should guide uh, you and your referral process. What does all this mean? You know, simply what we're saying is that pre-release planners are a necessary component of post-release supervision uh, because they can provide you with a context of the risks and needs that the individual faced, as well as allow for bridging the in-prison programming with prison supervision. Uh, to release services uh, to maintain this continuity or this continuity of care. To uh, our third element of case planning for police supervision, um, and this is one that uh, um, I have uh, spent some time uh, researching in, in, in my career here at APPA, is the idea of the imposition of conditions. Um, and specifically, what I've looked at how uh, conditions can affect um, office workload and growing. And I think that we all know that, that currently there is not a, a, a recognized set of national um, conditions of supervision in existence. It would be nice if, if we, we knew the exact uh, arrangement of conditions that every offender or every particular type of offender should have uh, all across the country. That would be great if we could do that. But currently we understand that uh, community corrections populations are so huge and they're so diverse that that's not quite been uh, um, something that's been, a real, that's been realistic. However, uh, some other researchers, uh, namely Paul Gendro and, and some of his colleagues, they identified elements of effective post-release um, conditions. And I think you'll notice 
that these elements are going to uh, be similar to or at least run along the same philosophical lines of some of the stuff that uh, AT was presenting to us in the pre-release planning stages. So uh, Joe and his colleagues, they suggest that uh, the first element of effective post-release uh, conditions would include things that occupy a bulk of individuals' time with intensive behavioral adjustment treatment. So this is going to be essentially eating up or occupying uh, an offender's time with formal uh, types of treatment settings whether it be GED training, substance abuse training, uh, conflict management, et cetera. But nonetheless, a, a lot of the individual's free time is spent within these intensive behavioral adjustment uh, uh, treatment uh, settings. Uh, two uh, is being pro-social behavior with positive reinforcement. Again, this fits with AT uh, uh, was saying regarding the carrot and the stick. And so um, for some reason it seems like uh, um, for each of us in our lives, the, the, applying the stick comes much easier than the carrot, and that it's very easy for us to apply negative reinforcers to behavior we don't want to thwart that behavior. Um, but it seems, as, especially in community corrections and in justice system, set, that it's more difficult for us to offer positive reinforcement. And, and these can be simple things um, to recognize that an offender is on the right track, and they may be simple things just even as acknowledging that an offender is doing good just verbally, um, maybe even something in writing, or there's various voucher techniques that folks use uh, to provide folks with bus vouchers or you know meal coupons or very small sorts of positive reinforcers to mark uh, these pro-social behaviors, the things that offenders are doing that, that you like and that are in accordance with uh, uh, moving them away from antisocial behavior. And then third is encouraging individuals to spend time in pro-social context to support law-abiding lifestyles. So this is essentially kind of a fancy way to say that uh, you're going to encourage uh, returning individuals uh, in their free time, in, in, in their informal uh, networks, to spend time with folks that are pro-social. And I know that a lot of folks that are coming in and out of our prisons and jails don't have a lot of friends that are pro-social, that are you know, employed and, and are following law-abiding lifestyles. Instead, they're surrounded by other uh, uh, like-situated individuals. We should be encouraging folks to spend time in pro-social uh, uh, context, and this can include uh, uh, active in a local church. It could be, you know, engaging in some other kind of voluntary organization, uh, pretend local sports, uh, and an assortment of things to, uh, um, again, occupy individuals' time with pro-social sorts of things. And then I think about the imposition of conditions and the type of con things that offenders should have to do as a condition of their supervision. I I'm always reminded of what our executive director here at APPA, um, Carl Wicklin, refers to as the three R's of supervision. And these are, you know, he puts this very simply in that, you know, all conditions should be realistic, they should be relevant, and they should be research-based. So, you know, what, that sounds good, I, I suppose, in rhetoric, but what do these things mean? And, and what these things mean is that um, uh, the three R's of supervision highlight the importance of setting conditions that individuals have a real potential to successfully complete. They are realistic for an individual, uh, and agencies have a realistic chance of enforcing, and that you're not applying conditions that you know there's no way that you're going to be able to, you know, monitor those or hold offenders accountable. There's no reason to, to apply those uh, um, those conditions. I think those sometimes make probation and parole look, look watered down. Uh, then suddenly they're relevant. They're relevant to an individual criminal genetic needs. It's you know, only that you're applying drug testing and your analysis to individuals that have a problem with drugs. You're not just applying everybody to have to do UAs, you know, and that's just an example of trying to ensure that these are relevant to an individual. And then and then agencies should begin to incorporate, you know, research based um, sort of conditions, you know, things that over time were were, you know, getting this accumulation of knowledge of what works to successfully return offenders uh, to the community. And so those are being included. Incorporated. And so this makes me think of is some work by Amy Solomon and her colleagues at the Urban Institute, uh, um, and we put out a couple of years ago the 13 parole strategies. And, and just a couple of things that they recommended, I obviously won't touch on all 13, but you know, they, they recognized uh, um, the need to focus on moderate and high-risk individuals, to you know, focus our resources on these folks, where we have the, the grist bang for our buck, so to speak, and that so that we can leave lower risk of uh, offenders alone. You 
you know, for one reason is we a lot of times don't have the time and the resources to, to, to uh, focus on those low-risk folks. But also we know from research by Chris Lowenkamp and some other folks that if we spend too much time with low-risk folks, we actually increase their likelihood of doing bad things and of uh, revocating. So at any rate, focusing our, our resources on those that we have the greatest ability to influence their, their, their uh, um, uh, to them as law-abiding citizens, so to speak, moderate and high-risk individuals. And we're also front-loading supervision resources. So, you know, as AT was talking about this experience that he had with an individual being released from prison and how difficult that individual was having, you know, here it would be that as individuals are being released from prison or jail, we're front-loading those supervision, that they have intensive supervision conditions, you know, the, the second that they walk out, that they have structure, you know, um, that they uh, realize that they have behavioral expectations on them, and they do have somebody that's watching them. It's providing earned discharge, you know, rewarding positive behavior. Uh, fourth, the tailoring conditions of supervision to individual needs and learning styles. And this, you know, we've talked about the risk and needs principle, and this is the responsivity principle that we've all heard so much about. So I suppose the, the, the point that I'm trying to make to, uh, um, to all of these things that I'm saying about conditions um, is that, you know, what we want to do is we want to avoid what Carol Luckin um, uh, has referred to as sanction stacking. And, and with sanction stacking, what she witnessed uh, when she was working with some agencies uh, in a southern part of the U.S., she recognized that, that offenders are given so many conditions. And some of them were rehabilitative and some of them were punitive and that they didn't necessarily fit any specific individual need, but they just had this large assortment of conditions that individuals had to do. And what she realized was that successfully completing all of these conditions was almost impossible or near or really unrealistic for offenders to meet. And it was a driving revocation that the nature of the conditions, um, that they weren't, you know, as Carl talks about, they weren't realistic, relevant, and research-based. And so this is our third our element to uh, um, effective case planning for post-supervision uh, release. This is to our fourth um, element to case uh, planning for post-supervision release. And this one, essentially, this idea of one size fits all, again, is, is uh, um, this word that we're all hearing quite a bit about, and it's this idea of responsivity. And what it gets to is this idea that uh, given the diversity and size of the population, of the, uh, um, a population that the community corrections field supervises, uh, we all know that it's impossible to provide a one-size-fits-all approach to supervision practices. However, uh, what we suggest is a more individualized approach to supervision. And this approach fits with the notion of responsivity by suggesting that community supervision practices should be matched to each individual under supervision. Now, I'm sure there's folks hearing this thinking that, you know, we're suggesting that each agency needs to come up with uh, um, uh, separate treatment tracks for every single individual that they have within their within their agency. But we're not necessarily saying that. What we're suggesting is this second bullet on our slide, and that individuals can be classified according to several uh, characteristics, which are those risk and need uh, um, characteristics that I imagine many of you are familiar with in the community corrections field and AT addressed earlier, is that we do know that, there, that individuals can be grouped according to the these characteristics, and that we can apply conditions, you know, based upon these groups and uh, individual needs. And so, when I think of this idea, I think of the idea of specialized uh, um, supervision and caseloads that um, that we're seeing, you know, uh, emerging all over the place, and that these can be based upon offender type, such that we're talking about uh, specific types of of interventions for sex offenders, or domestic violence offenders, or gang offenders. Or hopefully these uh, specialized caseloads can be developed um, based upon risk, and that you maybe you have uh, you know low risk caseloads, banked caseloads, kiosk caseloads, or you have the uh, you know that we used to see some years ago this idea of the intensive supervision caseloads or the extremely high caseloads you know based on risk. So we're just emphasizing this idea of responsivity and targeting individual criminogenic needs. Just to our our, our fifth element of um, effective case planning for post-release supervision. And, and this fifth element we'll discuss in the next two slides in that it essentially gets at the idea of officer approach. And I, th I think a long time in the community corrections field, what we talked about when we talked about officer and offender 
uh, interactions is it had to do with quantity of, you know, uh, have you been talking to this individual enough? Did you, were you able to check off that uh, that field visit, you know, when you knocked on the door or when you had that quick five or ten minute conversation within the office, you know, did, did you hit the quantity? And so I think uh, of contacts. And so what we're trying to talk about here is this idea that uh, um, community provision is more than quantity of interaction, but it's rather the quality of supervision. And so uh, there had research across the country that's identifying some of the uh, characteristics of this offender officer uh, interaction that can improve outcomes. So in the case of community supervision, you know, we're suggesting to some extent that officers are reactive. You know, and that we do know that officers are to respond to supervising behaviors, and that if an individual comes into your office, or if you're at a field visit and you see that the individual is unemployed, or they, you know, that they haven't been attending for treatments that they're supposed to go to, or their GED classes, or whatever it is that's listed in the case plan that they're supposed to be doing that they're not doing, you're reacting to that. Um, and and uh, uh, completely, if they are meeting those expectations you're reacting to that as well saying you know good job keep you know keep on this path this is this is good work you're reactive uh, but then also um community corrections officers can be can be proactive as well as they learn about the individuals on their caseloads and they begin to gain an understanding of the dynamic risks that these individuals face uh, for instance, you may have somebody on your caseload that you, uh, you know, learn from some employment group that they're going to lose their temporary job. Maybe a way that you can interact to kind of, you know, provide a buffer to that individual uh, uh, if you know he or she may maybe want to go off the handle when hearing that. Or simply you find out that an individual is going to be served with divorce papers or some other information that, that may be something that sets off this individual. And we're suggesting that, that uh, um, you know, that all can preempt or or that, that you're you're preempt to exactly how every offender is going to be acting. The idea is that through this uh, um, interaction um, with with offenders that you can be proactive and offer some buffer um, to individuals uh, um, you know, facing some of these dynamic uh, 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 dilemmas while they're on supervision. And then related to this whole idea of officer approach is this, this idea of the balanced approach. And, and this is uh, um, uh, something that's been emerging through research by, you know, Mario Paparozzi and Paul Gendro, and then also Jennifer Scheme at the University of California, Irvine, and some of her colleagues have been talking about this idea of the balanced approach. And so I would imagine that, that, that most folks familiar with community corrections are familiar with this first bullet of this idea of, uh, uh, you know, probation or parole officer is either of this social worker type or this law enforcer type, and social worker meaning uh, you know, being kind of a code code phrase for coddling offenders and maybe soft on offenders and law enforcement meaning you know the the person the officer that is you know very hard and very authorita authoritative with there's uh, uh, um, however what what we're finding or what Mario and, and Jennifer and some other folks have found is that um, the quality of relationship and interaction between officers and supervi supervisees. Um, focus on blending these personality traits lead to better outcomes among individuals under supervision. So that's to say that, y that community corrections officers are, are never just solely social worker or solely law enforcement, but you're constantly blending these personality traits to offer a little bit of, of both of these sorts of approaches at the correct time. As, as A.T. mentioned, you know, case management is a living, dynamic, you know, flexible process, and so so is this balanced approach. And so at any rate, many, many supervisees also have limited pro-social networks, as we discussed, and um, networks that they do have typically have strong antisocial influences. Uh, limited pro-social connections. And so officers can actually start to fill this pro-social network gap uh, by providing something of a model that challenges the ambiguities, as we know through motivational interviewing, this, these ambiguities to behavioral change that exist uh, within offenders. Um, and these ambiguities also, you know, prevent achieving behavioral adjustment goals. Further, officers who, em who embrace a dual role orientation, they create contexts that are more conducive to motivate behavioral change. And the dual roles emphasize trust, caring, and fairness with an attention towards toughness. Many in the, in the justice system that, that these may be uh, uh, um, difficult 
kind of ideas to to embrace this idea of trusting and caring uh, for offenders. But I, I do know in Jennifer Scheme's research that we have seen that by providing these sorts of contexts that uh, uh, it allows officers to embrace a, a dual-role approach that has been found um, to increase their ability to engage in active listening and directive supervision and to actually reason with individuals in an environment characterized more as participatory decision-making than authoritative. And while in the justice system it seems like you know being authoritative or being punitive has been a focus uh, um, that you know, folks in the research and the practitioner field to focus on. But what we know through behavior change, uh, you know, for a very long time, is that we know punishment is not what drives folks to change their behavior. Or I should say very rarely does punishment alone, you know, affect uh, um, our behavior. And that what does matter is that it's the certainty and swiftness to which behaviors are reacted to. You know, and that um, it's not just by ramping up punishment, you know, and by making things uh, uh, cost or the punishment for things uh, uh, more severe that we're going to change behavior. But it is, you know, individuals having with, with a high level of certitude that infraction that they have is going to be reacted to. And then also, not only is it going to be reacted to, but but we are going to react to it very quickly. You know, if there is a U, you know, for instance, the HOPE program that is working in and uh, uh, the National Institute of Justice piloted in Hawaii, you know, found this very thing that if individuals coming up with a with a dirty way, um, as soon as it's brought up, you know, within 72 hours they're sitting before a judge and and they're back in jail for 72 hours. You know, so it's not the idea of having to throw the book at them and, and you know throw them back for three years, but they found that by just instituting these you know 72 hour uh, 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 sentences that they were able to uh, bring about behavior change. To the five um, elements that we identified for effective uh, case planning for post supervision. Dr. D. Michelle, we thank you, and, and Director Wall, we thank you as well for your um, discussion on those key elements. Uh, in closing, um, you know, let's recap some of the main points of this training, because I know, know um, both Dr. Wall and Dr. D. Michelle discuss a, a number of different elements. Um, first of all, effective case planning strategies during reentry begin with pre-release planning, and you know that's definitely important to remember. Uh, we must properly prepare individuals for reintegration into their communities. This process should ideally begin at the time of intake. However, it should definitely occur no later than about 90 days from release from a, a general standpoint. Obviously, that, sta that, that time frame or that specific time frame is going to be a different agency. Central part of both release planning and post release supervision is conducting a risk needs assessment to identify the most appropriate level of supervision and for an offender to identify his or her most pressing needs during reentry. Uh, Dr. Drucker uh, discussed a, a number of these different points. Uh, when these issues are determined, we should incorporate a comprehensive approach involving many parties, uh, including prison staff, community corrections, mental health, employment services, and if possible, the offender's family. In sizing offenders, we must use a balanced approach. That is, as Dr. D. Michelle talked about, this balanced um, balancing between being a, a, a part of a social worker as part of a, and part of a law enforcer, which includes such things like understanding an offender's cultural values and warning an offender for positive behavior. Overall, we should actively engage offenders in the supervision process in order to produce the most effective results which is generally to reduce recidivism while encouraging offenders to develop more pro social lifestyle. Finally, as uh, both Direct Wall and Dr. D. Michelle spoke, uh, have said today, it's imperative to understand upfront that case plans can and will fail. Um, again, we have to be realistic uh, and have realistic expectations. Sometimes it may be due to unrealistic expectations on behalf of the officer. Other times it may be due to the supervisee's actions. Most of the cause, take these moments as learning opportunities and move directly into revising the plan to better meet the individual's needs. Uh, on that note, I'd like to thank both uh, Director Wall and Dr. DeMichelle again for their participation today. Uh, and before we leave you uh, and move into the QA session, I want to just bring your attention to one particular resource that uh, uh, has been released uh, uh, within the last year. Uh, it's a resource that's been uh, developed by the National Institute of Corrections. Uh, the past decade, uh, NIC has worked on the development of a transition from prison to the community model. Some of you may be familiar with this model. Uh, 
Uh -huh. NIC has worked with eight states as they've implemented the model and has shared the lessons from that experience in the TC Reentry Handbook, uh, implementing the NIC Transition for Prison to the Community model, uh, which was published in August of 08. Work has proceeded in the eight participating states. Significant efforts have been made to the translate the visions, goals, and principles of the model in the day-to-day -day work of managing individual cases in correctional agencies and their partners. And CPC case management handbook, uh, which is the link provided on the screen, um, is a companion to this to the NIC's TPC reentry handbook, as well as the Bureau of Justice Assistance increasing public safety through successful offender reentry handbook. Um, and so overall this handbook focuses more specifically on case management for successful reentry and we thought it would be noteworthy uh, and at least bring it to your attention. Right, that's right. So now we're going to turn our attention to the question and answer session. So I think most of you, or we've heard from a lot of you who have found your way to the Q&A box at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Um, but if you, if you haven't had a chance to type in your questions there, that's where you'll go. I'm going to, um, we've got a number of questions on some overlapping topics. So I'm going to do my best to cover as many of the topics that were raised here, and I'll be paraphrasing some of your more specific questions. So if you feel like I don't get the question right, feel free to shoot, shoot, shoot the question again, and we'll, we'll, we'll keep going through them as long as we have time. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up the webinar here at 3.30, so we've got about 25 minutes for Q&A. Um, Pick up on, on Nathan's overview of the Transition from Prison to Community Initiative Handbook on Case uh, Management. I got a question uh, from, from one of the participants asking where they may be able to find some examples of case plans or some other more concrete and specific case planning or case management tools. And so I want to encourage you to, to check out that National Institute of Corrections uh, case management handbook because um, it draws uh, examples and sample case plans from a number of the states that have participated in their transition from prison to community initiative. So they literally have a whole appendix full of examples and samples and uh, operating procedures and quality contact standard examples uh, for you to take a look at. So I just wanted to let you know uh, what, what, is, what is in there as well. And I know that several of you have asked for um, uh, the location of some of the uh, resources that Nathan also mentioned, including the 13 Parole Strategies document. Uh, so what we'll do when we send out the email, we'll, we'll, we'll put links to these uh, materials um, for you as well. So I so just wanted to circle back to that. So kicking off our questions, we've got a number of questions that asked about some more, uh, more information about what is Motivational interviewing, exactly. Uh, and why is it so important? Why should we be training our staff to do motivational interviewing, and wh why should we why should we use those techniques? What what value does that bring to our work? Nathan, you want to have someone in particular that you'd like to have, have answer that question? Um, Dr. Wall, would you want to give it a try? Uh, sure, and I'd be delighted if uh, Matthew went to it. Uh, motivational interviewing is in a system, an opportunity for staff to engage the offender in a way that uh, sort of opens the offender up. To say, uh, very often our questions with uh, offender past have been very sort of direct uh, and have yield yes or no kinds of responses, which we'll do record in our databases or on our forms, but don't necessarily get us to the point where we are reaching the, the offender's core. So motivational interviewing here is a way to, to cement the process between whoever it is that's conducting the interview and the offender and allow a greater range of, uh, of conversation. So instead of asking questions that are that begin with uh, "do" or "what," uh, the questions are more "how," "why." Uh, you know, 
let, you know, let's talk about that further. A lot of conversation to go in directions that aren't necessarily what the form uh, perceives. So that's how we find it valuable. It yields a better relationship and more information. I agree with um, AAT on uh, his description of MI, how they're using it in Rhode Island. And I guess, um, you know, maybe from a research perspective, the way I see it is that it, it, it helps to move individuals along what um, De Clemente and some other folks have referred to as these stages of change. And that I think that, um, again, I understand motivational interviewing is that, you know, whatever, you know, behaviors we may want to change in our own individual lives, that there, we've always have some kind of maybe attachments to the way that we had been acting before. And so we have these, we, these ambiguities or these, you know, conflicts that essentially, you know, develop internally that we may or may not recognize that prevent us from you know, moving along on these, you know, processes of change that we want. And motivational interviewing helps to, to try to direct the interaction time that officers have with offenders to try to, you know, break down those ambiguities and to reduce the, uh, you know, internal conflict that offenders may have when it comes to changing their behaviors. If I hear you right, motivational interviewing is a is a way of communicating with offenders, which is different uh, from uh, like a, a cognitive based program, like thinking for a change. Is that correct? It's not to say that uh, um, you know thinking for a change wouldn't include what is known as motivational interviewing, but the way that I would see it is that officers are going to use or are going to benefit from this idea of motivational interviewing by searing of offenders along a path towards changing. And so motivational interviewing isn't necessarily a program in and of itself. It is a way that officers interact with offenders. And really, you know, MI essentially came from, you know, the therapy, you know, the therapy world, mostly from substance abuse, but also in, in psychiatry in general. Um, because what they found were that very often in substance abuse counseling that you would – that individuals, clients would come in uh, and they would meet with their counselor and that they have so much time that was wasted that was just spent on what they called chatter, which is just kind of basic, uh, uh, you know, chit-chat that maybe a counselor and a, a client would have. And they were trying to reduce the amount of chatter to focus on substantive things that bring offenders, you know, to focus on, on their areas that they need to change. And we all know that uh, um, officers have a very limited amount of time that, that you get to spend with an, uh, with an offender, you know, maybe 15, 30 minutes a month uh, with some offenders. And so it's maximizing the amount of time that you interact with, with those offenders to, to try to, you know, push them along this path of change. If that. Yeah. Matthew, also, you know, many of our offenders score high on uh, criminal thinking and attitude. Attitudes. And often we uh, recommend putting in, them into cognitive-based programs as a way to address those criminal thinking and attitudes um, and patterns that are associated with that. Can you recommend any specific curriculum that might help address those needs, those type of criminogenic needs? I'm really apprehensive to, to recommend specific uh, um, curriculums that exist, uh, you know, that, you know, they're enrolling in. And, and you know, Declamate and, and, and several other folks, they have um, you know curriculums and, and literature out there on what they suggest. But I, I, I think what um, we are realizing um, is that cognitive behavioral treatment is difficult, um, and that those programs uh, um, do better than than you know business as usual, which is essentially you know being uh, a punitive and not addressing these um, thing styles that offenders have. Uh, AT, I don't know if you have a particular, you know, curriculum or program that you guys are using in Rhode Island that that you found most effective. What I say is that uh, we learned that cognitive behavioral approaches need to be integrated into virtually all of our programs. That there can be a foundational program, uh, such as Thinking for a Change, which is one that uh, Matthew you had mentioned. There can be a, a foundational program, and some people use that as sort of the portal. You need to take this program before you can participate in others. What we found is that when we're putting out requests for proposals and asking organizations to to services, that we want to see a cognitive behavioral approach to whatever program they're using. If it is uh, substance abuse treatment, if it is anger management, 
it, it is parenting. We want there to be a piece in which we are getting at the way the offenders think about their relationship vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world so that we find out if it's made up of a lot of feeling sorry for oneself or demonizing the victim or make excuses for the way they've reacted. All those habits and patterns of thought that are just hardwired into to, to us. I think that in your presentation today, um, there's this idea that came up a number of different times about uh, using techniques that build intrinsic motivation to change. I also mentioned different uh, techniques that are sort of external or extrinsic, uh, extrinsic motivation um, techniques. Can you explain the difference between those two different forms of motivations and also so can you describe some examples of way to, ways to build intrinsic motivation? Do you want to? Oh, me? Okay. okay. Yeah, I'll go. <laughs> I'm always, always trying to pass the buck. Um, I think that uh, these are um, uh, uh, two important things to uh, uh, differentiate. I think, you know, pointing on e external mechanisms are uh, essentially is what the justice system provides. Um, and I think that this is what the case plan provides, is it does provide this external structure um, to offenders' lives, saying that these are the sorts of things that you have to meet, and there are dates and goals and, and timelines applied to that. And the hope is, is that by, by applying this external structure that you're going to bring about individual or uh, intrinsic change so that essentially you bring about those things that motivational interviewing talks about or that cognitive behavioral approaches you know focus on which is the idea change the value system and the attitudinal system that offenders have so that you know from from there on that you know maybe they uh, uh, at, at one point they would think of you know missing work um, um, was was meaningless. Just meant that they would have to get another job, or they would miss a day's pay, and they don't really think about it. You know, they don't. You know, their view system is different. But as they're placed uh, on supervision and they have a, a clear, definable case plan, they start to realize that there are uh, that this choice of maybe just missing work uh, could lead to them being, you know, fired and unemployed, and how that can affect, you know, um, the our case plan and their entire entire period while they're on community supervision. So the way I see these these two pieces of the external and the internal is that the you know community the criminal justice or community supervision community includes the non justice partners, the family members, the friends, whomever else that you're you know enrolling in this uh, uh, reentry process that they're providing this structure that essentially forces individuals to alter their intrinsic uh, uh, thoughts and attitudes. Um, I don't know if AT, if you have maybe a better way to catch that. I think you've explained it uh, well, uh, Matthew. In essence, when we talk about carrots and sticks, we're talking about the external uh, motivations, as in you get a reward if you do it this way. You know, you won't have to be your probation officer more often. You'll get a better institutional job assignment. Or you will get, in essence, a punishment, a sanction if you don't comply. Uh, you will have to, you'll, you'll be to a curfew. You'll be written up, and uh, you'll lose some earned time. Those are geared at behavior. Those are, that's what we're looking for. But ultimate goal is the internal motivation. Because once those rewards and uh, sanctions are removed, when they move through the supervision process, you really want them to have internalized sense of uh, of pro so that they do for themselves without the external uh, motive. And uh, Director Wall, at Island, do you all include these incentives, incentives and sanctions in your case plans? Do you write them down in those plans themselves? We know that some jurisdictions do. We don't do that here. Uh, even though there's no reason why it can't be done. The reasons that we don't include them in the case plan are that the case plan, we don't want it so rigid and so formulaic that uh, it doesn't leave some room for our discretion on the part of the counselor or the supervising authority. And we also regard them as 
as techniques than as as must-owns or concrete uh, goals and objectives. They're, they're tools in the toolkit of staff to assist. And what we really want is, is the staff to know that they're there. Thank you. Um, moving on, there, I've got a number of different questions about different types of 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 case plans for different types of offenders. So mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering if um, if it would be possible to talk a little bit about what might you do with special populations of offenders, for example, women and girls or youth or uh, offenders with mental illness or sex offenders. How, how would you recommend addressing their unique risk and needs depending on special, their special population or their special characteristics? was right when he pointed out that one size does not fit all and that you can't write a generic case plan that can be applied to, to every uh, circumstance. And there are, in particular, special populations, and you've named some of them, Leanne. Uh, women, uh, sex offenders would be one. Uh, ill offenders, another people who in, are involved in uh, battering and domestic violence, still another. There are subcategories, and that uh, those plans need to be, need to take account of their unique circumstances. But, uh, and to the degree that you can, and you know, for many agencies this is uh, this, this stretch, but to, to the degree that you can, you want to be able to, you want to have staff or could agencies or even specialized cases loads where somebody has expertise in the particular needs and circumstances of those populations and recognizes that they that the incentives and the sanctions and the interventions may need to be different. Great. I also hear in, in your answer, Director Wall, that uh, sometimes perhaps specialized assessments may also be need to use to understand the specific risk and need profile of a special population. Would you say that's true? Yes, I would. We've certainly seen that with our sex offender population. It's not to say that the, uh, the general assessment that we use for all offenders is, uh, is something that we neglect, but we also have uh, a separate uh, assessment tool that we use in addition that eared very specifically to the kind of thinking that uh, that research on part and parcel of being a sex offender. Similarly, with women offenders, there are additional questions that uh, are asked as, asked as part of the assessment process that gets to some of the sort of unique circumstances that lead to a to to female criminal behavior. Behavior. Mm -hmm. I also, I'm seeing in the chat box right now a resource that might be helpful for folks that are looking at different types of assessments for different types of offender groups. And so you can find this at uh, tools.reentrypolicy.org. Um, I put the link right there. We'll include that in the email that goes out as well for those of you that are looking at different types of assessment instruments for your actual populations. Um, another question that I that I have um, is about you, know, you. You both mentioned the importance of uh, pro-social support networks uh, as you were talking through the the pieces of behavior change and the things that need to be in a person's life to support behavior change. I was wondering if y'all could talk a little bit of, more about uh, congregations and faith partners and family members and their role in case planning. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a, a, a try this answer. I think that um, you, you're correct that we did talk a lot about pro-social support networks and that um, so much of what research is bearing out uh, um, recently on improving uh, offender reentry is this idea of, of fixing these antisocial, you know, attitudes, values, and, and peer networks. And um, so essentially what I, I always think of is, um, you know, first criminological theory, you know, known as uh, differential association. But it essentially uh, says this idea of not hanging out with, with uh, um, you know, uh, criminal peer.
disappears essentially and gets to that idea of you know what everybody's grandmother always told them about birds of a, fo- a feather flocking together. And so the idea here is to incorporate you know family members and friends that are willing to in the case plan. And I, I know that um, I, I've seen there, there are some agencies that will actually incorporate family members into the case plan, uh, into designing the case plan, actually allow them to sign off of on it as well as the offender and the officer. Uh, that faith-based institutions offer a, a really excellent opportunity to get individuals involved in pro-social support networks. And, and that doesn't mean just by a, attending uh, uh, churches or any religious services, but being involved with a faith-based institution by you know attending cookouts and a, a, attending or, or, or fish fries or, or whatever other public uh, uh, events that they have are going to be times that um, these individuals aren't spending with, uh, you know, antisocial peers. Great. Thank you. Um, community resources and services are increasingly limited because of budget restraints. Can you discuss uh, the development of the case plan and the tension between uh, putting service referrals in case plans uh, that balance actual resource availability? Uh, sure. Yeah. Well, I think that, um, and I'll be interested to see what AT uh, uh, has has to say on this issue. But I, I think each community is going to have to, you know, do an assessment of what sorts of resources um, that they have within their within their area, and the that the ability that they're going to have at service referral, and that, and I know in some rural communities it's, uh, you know, difficult to uh, find. Uh, you know, multiple service providers for any any type of service, if if services are even may be found. Um, whereas in urban areas, they may have you know more opportunities. But I think the uh, defining thing is that uh, community corrections officers are going to have to you know analyze what is available in their area, and um, and then too you know not being afraid to, to contact service providers. You know, many I think I've spoke with service providers that you know they claim they have trouble um, getting in touch with community corrections officers, and I've talked. Community corrections officers that said it's about community organizations. So I think at some level, uh, uh, it, it comes to the the point where folks have to pick up the phone and contact these other agencies uh, in their jurisdictions and see if they're willing to even uh, you know come to the table and meet to discuss ways that they could uh, develop partnerships. But we may have some more concrete um, you, know, the, you know strategies that, that they've been using in Rhode Island. Sure, I will say that I agree with. You, Matthew, that requires an entrepreneurial kind of approach. There, I hear regularly about the frustration that offenders feel when a case plan, a discharge plan, is written that isn't realistic. Uh, that that's a setup, and it's very difficult to have to acknowledge that certain resources aren't available. It needs to be said. I think we owe people not only best effort but also the truth. Having been said, I think our job is to do an awful lot of leveraging, meaning mm-hmm. that uh, the resources available through a correctional agency uh, are limited. There are an awful lot of other agencies out there on both the federal and state level that represent other do- doors through which offenders can walk, meaning the people call inmates and offenders, they're calling clients and consumers. And they're eligible for those things, not because they've been involved with the law, but because they are members of society. And so labor and uh, you know, em- skill development, employment opportunities, that's not our expertise, but there is a well-funded network uh, out there uh, that works all unemployed people, including ours. Some of the mental health systems System. If you meet certain criteria, it doesn't matter whether you're involved in the justice system or not. We need to do those folks in the mix and and persuade them that, to, that we don't own the offender, that they have a role to play uh, as well. And when things are really bad, uh, well, suppose that uh, somebody is going to be discharged to homelessness. There is there's family out there that uh, that is available or that wants to take in the offender. There is no money. There is no special program. We need to be realistic about that and contact the homeless shelter and work with uh, the institutional people and the probation and parole people need to work and be prepared to supervise that offender at the shelter. Uh, 
almost nightly basis. I think we've got uh, time for one more question, and I think it's a particularly important question, and it, and it takes us back to the conversation we were having about what, what, what meant, Director Wall, Wall, when you were talking about risk. What I heard you say is that when you were talking about prioritizing higher risk offenders, you were meaning offenders that were at higher risk of recidivism. Can you a little correct? Okay, good. Um, so when I hear you say that, I hear that you, there's a difference between custody and security or institutional classification risk and recidivism risk. We measure those things and, and prioritize around risk. We're talking about recidivism risk versus custody and security inside uh, the institution. Is that correct? You're absolutely right, Leanne, and uh, uh, I am glad the opportunity to clarify that. We engage in classification in the institutions to determine where you be housed, what, what level of custody do you require. That's a different question than what your risk to reoffend uh, may uh, once you're released. So we can there, there are some people that we house uh, in very close custody because they are they adjust poorly in the institution, or they are uh, they're at risk of being victimized and so forth. That's a different question than what the possibility of reoffense is. And to clarify further, when I'm talking about being at high risk, I'm talking not only about high risk. I'm not talking about high risk to reoffend when you're released. I'm not talking about what the nature of the crime is to be. In other words, it doesn't mean you're going to commit a murder or you are going to engage in arson. It could be a high risk to go back to drug dealing. So it's not level or seriousness of the crime. It's the likelihood that you're going to go back to a life of crime that I mean when I say high risk to reoffend. It's very helpful. I wanted to thank Thank Director Wall, and also thank you, Matthew and Nathan uh, from APA for uh, participating today uh, in our webinar on case management. I thought it was very thorough and very helpful to me, so I appreciate the overview. I've included contact information for both Matthew and Nathan as well as Sean Rogers, who is here with the National Reentry Resource Center. If you have question or are seeking additional information or more detail. I realize we didn't get through every single question today. So feel free to follow up and we'd be happy to connect you to resources and respond to your questions. I also wanted to let you know uh, to sign up for future webinars or to find out more about uh, reentry related funding or reentry related resources, I'd encourage you to visit our website at www.nationalreentryresourcecenter.org as well as sign up for our monthly newsletter which will have up to date information about funding opportunities um, and, and other distance learning opportunities uh, coming up uh, in the next few months as well. So please sign up and I wanted to thank you again to our uh, participants and thank you again to our um, panelists for coming and, and speaking with us today. At the end of the webinar, you'll be asked to fill out a survey, and I would encourage you to do that. So we'd, we'd love to hear from you and find out how we can uh, meet your needs and, and prepare for future webinars down the road. Um, so this concludes the Case Management Strategies webinar, and we look forward to uh, hearing from you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well.